It's been 2,000 years since the glorious light of the cross illuminated a world veiled in darkness and confusion about the character of God. And still today, the greatest need of mankind is a revelation of God's love as revealed in the life of Christ. Amazing Facts presents the Everlasting Gospel with Pastor Doug Batchelor. Coming to you each week from Sacramento Central Church in sunny California. Discover hidden treasures in God's Word today. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we, we are so privileged and full of joy to come into your house of worship on your special holy day that you've set aside at the foundation of this world. We thank you and we praise you. We praise you for the, the laughter we enjoy from a baby. We praise you for the beauty of a flower. From the complexity of the universe, we can see the power that is in your word. Lord, we come to you with uh, just so much joy in fellowship, in coming together, sharing, in lifting our voices as we have seen and heard this morning. Lord, we also come with some burdens, with some things that uh, we know that only you can take from us and cure us from. We lift up specifically Jim Beaver's sister who has uh, experienced a stroke and is in ICU at this time. Lord, I also ask for your blessing to be poured upon those that uh, are hurting, not just physically but mentally. Lift them up. Give them uh, comfort through your word. And Lord, as we turn to your word and we understand that it is you that has is, that is written this word, the Bible, that we are going to partake in this morning, that we reverently and, and uh, bring our hearts and minds as the Holy Spirit rests upon us, that we understand completely and fully what you would have us to understand. It is difficult to contemplate the mercy, the love that you have bestowed upon us, and we thank you for that. Lord, we also have a time in our in our uh, year that we recognize those that have gone before us and are still within harm's way in serving this great country that you've ordained to be uh, set above and be looked at by the world as, as a place, a haven. Lord, we want to uh, cherish the families that have uh, sacrificed in having them serve. Lord, thank you so much for your love. I thank you for this church. I thank you for the pastoral staff that represents you in imparting your word to us that we will partake in at this time, and especially send your Holy Spirit to Doug Batchelor that he might have the words that you would have him to speak to us about your loving Savior, Jesus, who has come and died for us, that we might be saved and join you in heaven someday. Bless us and keep us. In this I pray in your name. Amen. Uh, this message this morning is part of a series. If this is the only time you've been here, this is part five out of a six-part series. And uh, uh, you can probably listen to the other parts on the internet or get them somehow, but um, just wanted you to know we're talking about Days of Destiny, and this really focuses on the most important times and events surrounding the sacrifice of Jesus during those last few days, beginning with the Last Supper, and it reaches up to the Ascension. Now today we're more specifically dealing with the burial and the resurrection of Jesus, and this would be part five. Our last section, we're going to be studying the final instruction and appearances of Jesus after the resurrection. There is a, a, a treasure trove of biblical encouragement and information in these studies and in these events that surrounded the life of Jesus. For a little bit of review, I'd like to go back to Luke chapter 23, just as Christ was dying, uh, I had to rush during the last presentation a little bit and uh, cover some of this ground. At the end of his sufferings, remember Jesus spent about seven hours on the cross, six hours alive, approximately an hour from the time he died until his body was retrieved, six hours suffering for the sins of the world, the seventh hour resting from his work of uh, saving the world. And when he cried out with a loud voice, 
He said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last and yielded up his spirit. This further illustrates that nobody took his life. He laid it down. He yielded up his spirit. It's interesting, the first recorded words of Jesus are, I must be about my father's business. In the garden, he's saying, Father, if there's any way, take this cup from me. And then finally, the last words before the resurrection are, Father, into your hands. That's a good prayer for us to remember. We may need it someday. Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And then he yielded up his spirit. Now, when he died, several things happened. Matthew 27, it says, Behold, the veil in the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. Now that's significant because that veil was approximately 30 feet wide and 60 feet high and about three inches thick. It was woven with fine twine, the book of Exodus tells us, of blue, purple, and scarlet material, twisted linen, very strong, that could not accidentally rip. It was obviously torn by an unseen hand, something like the hand that wrote on the walls of Babylon years earlier. You have the tearing of two things. At the beginning of Jesus' trial, the high priest tears his robes, signifying we now have a new priesthood. Then when Jesus dies on the cross, you've got a tearing of the veil. This veil separated the most holy from the holy place and it represents now that we're entering into a whole new temple. Now we're dealing with the temple of Christ's body. Remember Jesus said, destroy this temple made with hands, in three days I will raise it up. I will make one without hands. And that's speaking of the church. You are the temple of God. You and I are the, the body of Christ. And so there was a lot of significance in what was happening here. Furthermore, that veil represented a barrier that separated man from God. In Christ, that barrier is removed. You and I can now go boldly before the throne of grace through Jesus. Amen? Amen. Furthermore, the rending of that veil signifies, and you know, it happened at a moment when they were just getting ready to offer the evening sacrifice on this preparation day of the Passover weekend, and it was a high sacrifice for them, and just as they are getting ready to prepare the lamb and to sacrifice it, there's an earthquake. They hear this ripping sound. They see the Holy of Holies is exposed. And um, the blood probably drained from the faces of the priest. They drop their knife. The little victim scampers away. And that all signified that the real Lamb of God was at that moment dying outside the city. The whole significance of the ceremonial laws and the Passover met its fulfillment in the reality of Jesus as the Lamb of God. Do we need to sacrifice lambs anymore? There are still things that can be gleaned from the ceremonial laws and the sacrificial system, but we don't need to practice those things now because Christ is our Passover. We don't need to kill lambs anymore. Circumcision should be that of the heart and so this was a very significant event when he said, it is finished, Father, into your hands. A number of things were finished at that time. Then there's an earthquake. Now, not only was there an earthquake when Jesus died, there's another earthquake when he rises. And we'll get to that in just a moment. It says in Matthew 27, 51, and the earth quaked and the rocks were split and the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and the earth quaked and the rocks split now I remember one time reading about the torrential rains in Southern California and there was a big cemetery that was located by one of those Highway 1 or Highway 101 down in Southern California and the cemetery was on a hillside and because of the oversaturation and because of all the graves that created a little honeycomb effect this whole cemetery slid down into the road. And they actually had a news anchor there that was trying to describe the event <laughs> to the viewers. And I thought uh, that would have been a difficult object to cover because uh, you had the cemetery and all it contains now exposed in a public freeway. But it must have been something that um, 
Friday afternoon when Jesus died because this earthquake actually, some of the tombs cracked open. Now, the bodies didn't come out right then. It says after his resurrection they arose. But these tombs were opened up and uh, there was a special resurrection. We'll get back to what the significance of that was in a little bit. Not all, you notice it says many of the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the graves when after his resurrection they went into the holy city. Is this a universal resurrection? No. The holy city is one city they went into. The city there. They were something like living testimony of uh, the resurrection of the Lord. Um, you know, Jesus said that if these should keep silent, the stones would cry out. And when the disciples should have been speaking up for Jesus at the cross, the only testimony he had was the Roman soldier. You have the thief on the cross. And uh, the disciples were standing afar off watching these things. So the rocks rent, and he gets the resurrection testimony from some of the saints who slept. Who are those who were raised in this special resurrection? Does anyone know? Well, the Bible doesn't tell their names. Probably some of those who had died as martyrs for Christ. We know some people who are not in that group, because in Acts chapter 2, Peter says, David is not yet ascended to heaven. So it probably wasn't David, but maybe Jeremiah, who died for his faith, maybe Isaiah, maybe John the Baptist. I mean, wouldn't that be appropriate to have John come forth? He called him the greatest of the prophets. So we could only speculate who might have been in that group, but some of those who were entombed around Jerusalem, they were raised to bear testimony to the validity of Jesus being the Messiah and to uh, witness to the people there in the holy city. And so that's happening. The Roman centurion who sees the resurrection, I'm sorry, who sees the earthquake and the darkening of the day, who hears Jesus cry out, he's overwhelmed, just like that thief on the cross with the evidence that Jesus is who he says, and he declares, truly this man was the Son of God. Now was there witness at the cross? You've got the sign above the head of Jesus, truly, that says, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. You've got the thief on the cross who says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. You've got the testimony of Simon who helped bear the cross. Then you've got the testimony of this Roman centurion. You know, one thing I think that the Lord is doing here in the testimony of the Roman centurion is something of the first fruits telling us that many Gentiles now were about to come into the church. I mean, even Pilate had said, I find no fault in him. And so this soldier, and who was the first Gentile that is preached to? It isn't Paul preaching to the Gentiles. It's Peter going to Cornelius' house. So the first Gentile that is preached to is a centurion. Is it possible that this centurion was Cornelius? Well, probably not. You'd think it would say something about that, but you wonder, huh? Just something to think about. And then we declare that uh, they wanted to, uh, to validate that Jesus had died. Uh, it seemed almost too soon for him to die from crucifixion. So they pierce his side, and from his side come two distinct flows of blood and water. And that signifies, of course, that we must be born of the water, born of the Spirit. The washing of water, symbol of baptism, the washing in the blood. But something I didn't mention last time we talked about this was when Adam went to sleep, God opened his side and he brought out his bride, Eve. When Jesus went to sleep, his side was opened up and with that flow of blood and water, the church was born. Jesus was the second Adam. And there by his ribs, an incision was made. Now we're going to pick up where we left off and we're going to talk about the... Um, the devastated disciples and the sequence of events connected with the resurrection. Now I did this week what I've done in other weeks. When we look at the four Gospels, you'll find the Gospel writers, they all mention different aspects of the events around the, the trial and the crucifixion. And I've basically taken the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You know what I want to do someday if someone hasn't already done it? If someone's done it, tell me about it. I'd like to take 
the Gospels and arrange all four Gospels as one and explain. This is not the Bible. This is simply for reading study purposes. But take the different components that all the writers cover. Put them as best as you can in sequential order and go from the birth of Jesus all the way through Acts. And at least there's no uh, argument about Acts. But um, overlay them so that they all go together. The resurrection and the burial of Christ confuses people because the Gospels all give different aspects. Part of the reason is the different women that come to the tomb are coming from different directions at different times. And so you're getting the perspective of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all a little different angle at which they observe these things. But let me read through this for you, and, uh, and it's not perfect, but the way I read the Bible and have studied this, this is the way it happened by putting all the stories together. Now behold, there was a rich man named Joseph of Arimathea, a city of the Jews, a prominent council member, a good and just man, who himself was also waiting for the kingdom of God. He had not consented to their decision indeed. This man, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, taking courage, <clears throat> he went to Pilate and asked the body of Jesus. Pilate marveled that he had already found out from the centurion, I'm sorry, Pilate marveled that he was already dead, and summoning, summoning the centurion, he asked him if he had been dead for some time. So when he found out from the centurion, he granted his request and commanded the body be given to Joseph. Then he and Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus down, wrapped it in clean linen cloth. Now the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden was a new tomb. Joseph had hewn out of rock for himself. No one had yet used it. That day was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew near. So there they laid Jesus, because the Jews' preparation day was near at hand, and the tomb was nearby. And the women who had come with him from Galilee, with Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. So they rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oil, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. On the next day, which followed the preparation day, what day would that be? Sabbath. The chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember, while he was still alive, how that deceiver said, After three days I'll rise. Therefore command that the tomb be made secure until the third day lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people he's risen from the dead. So the last deception would be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have your guard, go your way, make it as secure as you know how. So they went and they made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. <clears throat> now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week, on the first day of the week as it was still dark, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary the mother of James, and Salome came to see the tomb. They had brought sweet spices that they might come to anoint him. And they said among themselves, Who will roll away for us the stone of the door of the tomb? And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, and his clothing was white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. When the women arrived, it began to dawn, and they looked and saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he said to them, Be not affrighted. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he had said, Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way quickly and tell his disciples and Peter that he is risen from the dead and that he goes before you into Galilee and there you will see him as he said to you. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly and they fled from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples word. For they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man for they were afraid. But now while they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests the things that had happened. And when they assembled with the elders, they consulted together, and they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, Tell them that his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. 
And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is still commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Meanwhile, the other women arrived at the tomb, and they found the stone rolled away uh, from the sepulcher. And they entered in and found not the body of Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. It's probably the one by the side inside and the one who had been sitting on the stone. And as they were afraid and perplexed, uh, they bowed down their faces to the earth. And they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he's risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Then Mary Magdalene ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They've taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've laid him. Peter, therefore, went out and the other disciple and they were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple, likely John, outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And stooping down, looking in, saw the linen clothes lying there, and he didn't go in. Simon Peter came, following him, and he went into the tomb and saw the linen clothes lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also. He saw and believed, for as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away to their own homes, wondering in themselves that which was come to pass. Now when it was early, the first day of the week, Jesus appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. This is after Peter and John had left. Mary stood without the tomb, weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked in to the sepulcher. And seeing two angels in white, one at the head, the other at the feet of where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said to her, Woman, why do you weep? She said, Because they've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've laid him. And when she had said this, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing there and didn't know it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have borne him hence, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary? And she turned herself and said, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. And Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. Soon after, as the other woman went to tell the disciples, behold, Jesus met them and said, Rejoice. So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. And Jesus said, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren, and go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that had, um, that had been with them as they mourned and wept that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. And when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, they believed not. Now, that's obviously not all of them because it says John did believe. Next, Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women that were with them, returned from the sepulcher, and they told these things to the apostles and to all the rest. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they believed not. So we know that uh, the majority did not believe. Now, that's the subject of our study this morning, this section. And I just wanted to pull it all together and read everything that's in all four of the Gospels on this event and do my best to line it up for you. And I hope that was helpful, and if you want a copy of that, uh, the sequence of the resurrection events, I think it does match with the Bible, and it does match with the spirit of prophecy, and uh, hopefully that will maybe answer some questions. Now, when Jesus died, I'm going back, and we're going to pick up where it begins, and he's on the cross. Can you imagine the devastation of the disciples? They had all of their hopes centered on him. They're shocked because every other time that Christ had been threatened or betrayed, he had walked through the crowd, he had used his power, and here he seemed so helpless. They thought that he was the Messiah, and the shock of him actually being dead, everything about their senses told them he was dead. I, you know, I, it is so amazing to me, every now and then I watch on the History Channel or Discover, they'll have some special on Bible things. I think they do research to find the worst possible experts out there <laughs> to talk about these things. 
And um, they'll get some character who says, well, Jesus probably didn't die. He fainted or he was in some chemically induced coma, some herbs, and he slept and then he came out of it and the whole thing was created to, how could you fake being stuck by a spear in your side? And um, it says, you know, he was blue, he was dead. The Roman soldiers and, and examined him. Everything said he was dead. All of their senses said that he was dead. It was not a coma. And it was so discouraging for them. And finally, when they got the body, it's a good thing that it happened the way it did because uh, typically criminals were thrown in some kind of a, uh, a mass grave or or dumped in a, an unclean place, or they might be buried in the potter's field that you read about in a previous study. And it says, when the whole crowd came together at that site, seeing what had been done, they beat their breasts and returned. Most of the people loved Jesus. That's why the priests had to have a nighttime trial. And it was just totally shocking for them when they saw what happened. After this, Joseph of Arimathea came. Um, he was not invited to the trial, neither was Nicodemus, because they knew that he would speak in favor of Christ. Evidently, they had done it before. He boldly went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. This fulfills the prophecy in Isaiah 53 that said, speaking of the Messiah, he made his grave with the wicked, crucified between two criminals, and the rich in his death. How bizarre, what an obscure prophecy to say, that he would be killed with the wicked and yet his grave is with the rich. But uh, Joseph was a very wealthy man. He had a grave that was designed for kings. Only the very wealthiest people could have a grave carved by solid rock. It sometimes took years for them to carve a grave like that and I've been to the garden tomb there and seen that and I think I've got a picture I'll show you later. It takes a long time to have that chiseled out of solid rock and he was in a rich man's grave. That's something that was designed for a king. And then it tells us more about the burial of Jesus here. In John 19, verse 30, uh, 39, And Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds. You know, uh, last night we were having evening worship in our family, and... Uh, I've been teaching the kids that song, Ivory Palaces. Does anyone here remember that song? Out of the ivory palaces. I won't sing the whole thing. But there's a verse in there that says, talks about the myrrh and aloes. And most people, if they don't know their Bible, they don't know, what is that talking about? It's quoting from uh, Psalm 45, where it says, all of your garments are scented with myrrh and aloes and cassia, out of the ivory palaces by which they have made you glad. So they came and they anointed him like a king, but they did not complete the anointing. They wanted to finish it, but they couldn't because the Sabbath was coming. Notice what it says here as you read on. Um, they wrapped him in cloth. Verse 40, they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen as the custom of Jews is. How many of you have seen specials on the Shroud of Turin? You know, this big shroud that's got sort of this image they say is Jesus. It's probably not because they've carbon dated it and it, the first time it appears in history is about 1200 A.D. and the carbon dating for it is about 1200 A.D. When you read in the Bible about how Jesus was embalmed, it says he was wrapped in strips. It wasn't one big sheet and there was a napkin around his head and nothing about the shroud shows any of that so the wrapping is all wrong according to the shroud. So I hope none of you are getting ready to make a pilgrimage to Italy there and uh, worship this relic because I, I, I think it, it may be interesting they're still not sure how that impression got on there but I don't think that was the grave cloth of Jesus um, and it tells us he was wrapped in strips you know another time when that happened when Jesus came into the world what do you read there in Luke she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths those were strips of cloth and laid him in a manger and now at the end of his life he's wrapped again in this linen and laid in a tomb from the, the womb to the tomb as they say now in that place where he was crucified there was a garden where did the problem begin in a garden where did the solution end it's in a garden and in the garden there was a tomb where no one had yet been laid 
You notice it says this is a new tomb, it's a rich man's tomb, and it's a tomb that is clean. No one has ever used it because Jesus is a symbol of his sinlessness and his perfection. And they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Now, were they done embalming his body when the Sabbath came? Why else would they be coming back Sunday morning on the first day of the week? They weren't complete. Now, this to me is what you would call a slam dunk for the Sabbath truth. If Jesus had said anything during his three and a half years of ministry that gave the disciples any inkling of an idea that the Sabbath was not important to him or it was going to be done away with, that we're not under the law because, you know, there are different views. Some Christians say we don't keep any Sabbath anymore because we're not under the law. Others say we keep it on a different day. But it was so important to the disciples that they would not even finish their work of, their labor of love in embalming his body because after three and a half years of listening to the teachings of Jesus and his modeling Sabbath keeping for them, they never got the slightest notion that it would be okay to finish that. They said, let's wait until the Sabbath's over. They had up to four days to finish. After four days, they figured the spirit was gone. And they were going to come back Sunday morning. And yet, the sun is starting to go down. We're not done vacuuming. We say, oh, the Lord will understand if I vacuum a little longer. All the dishes aren't quite done yet, but the Lord will understand. You know, I'm not quite done mowing the yard. I know the sun's going down, but I've got two or three more strips to go. I want you to think about that. How careful should we be in keeping the Sabbath if the disciples, if it was that important to them? Say amen. Because I venture to say most of us here would say, well, the ox is in the ditch. Let's finish embalming his body even though the Sabbath has started. I really believe we have lost the idea of the sanctity of the Sabbath. It was so important to them that they would not even finish embalming his body. So they went home and rested the Sabbath. You notice it doesn't say according to the Jewish law. Luke, who is a Gentile, says according to the commandment. And he didn't have to explain what commandment because he knew every Christian knew what commandment it was. Now, the next day, how careful are the religious leaders, the enemies of Christ, how careful are they in their Sabbath keeping? On Sabbath, they begin to wring their hands. They're thinking, have we done everything we can do? to make sure that we've stomped this out, that he's not coming back. And some say, you know, he said he was going to rise again. We got word on that. Our spies heard him say that. It, to me, is mind-boggling that his enemies remembered that Jesus said he was going to rise and the believers didn't remember. Where does it say that the children of this generation are wiser than the children of light? Sometimes it's the people in the world that are more careful with the health message than the people who have it. <laughs> I mean, you often see where sometimes there, there are people in the world who are pagans that are keeping aspects of the truth more carefully than the children of light are. There are, <laughs> there are people out there that don't even believe the Bible that study it more than believers do for the purpose of refuting it or fighting it or opposing it. I've met a couple people in my time that have debated the Bible with me. They're atheists, and I was shocked that they knew their Bible so well. They tried to prove atheism from the Bible. I've had people call the radio program to argue against Christianity who are from the Islamic faith, and they begin to quote New and Old Testament, and I think to myself, you know, they know their Bibles better, and they're Islamic than some of my members do. They're studying it to fight it. And here are the enemies of Christ. They knew that he was going to rise the third day. And the believers were all distraught because they'd forgotten that Jesus told them so plainly. I wonder how much heartache we've bought ourselves over the course of our life because we don't read God's word and listen to what he says. Think about all the sadness they experienced that weakness, the devastation, the heartache, because they didn't believe what he plainly told them that he would rise again. So they get a troop of soldiers. There's a centurion. Centurion usually has a hundred. Century has a hundred years. You got a hundred Roman soldiers guarding a grave? We were in uh, China and they've got these Chinese guards. Look like about maybe six or eight of them guarding this 
monument to Mao. In different parts of the world, there are different guards that guard tombs. A hundred soldiers to guard a tomb is really overkill. Could you keep Jesus in the grave? So they said, Sir, Pilate, give us some soldiers, because we remember this deceiver said after three days. We remember what he said. Do you remember what he says? It's interesting that the devil's plan to keep Jesus in the grave and to have those soldiers there, did it help him at all or did it hurt him? What did those hundred soldiers end up doing? Before the Jewish leaders had a council meeting and, say, and paid them off and says they paid a very large sum of money. They paid those soldiers a lot more than they paid Judas. Because if a Roman soldier was caught sleeping at his post, death sentence. You remember when you read in Acts chapter 12, Peter slipped through the fingers of 16 Roman soldiers and Herod had them killed because Peter got away. These hundred soldiers lose a dead man. He's not even alive. I mean, if you can't keep track of a dead guy. And so they had to pay a lot of money for them and then guarantee them that they would go to Pilate and say, don't oh, take it out on them. It, you know, it's not their fault. And uh, evidently it worked. Hundred soldiers couldn't keep him in the tomb, but it backfired. You know why? The devil's plans to prevent God's miracles always end up becoming the endorsement. What's the best proof for the Red Sea? Is it the children of Israel crossing over or the Egyptian soldiers that drown? If the water was only six inches deep, as some have said, then how could the, Rome, or how could the Egyptian army drown? It ends up becoming an endorsement. What is the greatest proof of the heat of the furnace that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego survived through? You know, there have been some of these experts on these programs that say, well, that furnace wasn't really that hot. They were actually just fire walkers, you know, like in Fiji. They just, they, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego walked across the fire, and it was really no miracle. People do that all the time. Oh, really? Well, the Bible says it was so hot, it killed the soldiers that threw them in. And then people say, well, those lions didn't eat Daniel because there had been a turnover in the Persian Empire when they overthrew the Babylonians, and those poor lions had eaten so many political prisoners that when they threw Daniel and they just groaned and burped and rolled over, they could not eat another prisoner. <laughs> oh, really? you got to keep reading. But you hear these experts and you think they're not reading the story. It's amazing to me. What happened to the accusers of Daniel? It says, when they were thrown in, those lions got their appetite back. <laughs> because they tore them to pieces before their bodies hit the ground. And so what the devil often does to try to prevent the miracle ends up becoming the endorsement of the miracle. And there's a number of cases of that in the Bible that you can see. So it backfired for them. And then they put a seal on the tomb. Now what did that do? You know, I thought that it was interesting. Just, just listen. I don't know what to do with this, but just write it down and think about it. A seal was placed on a stone on the Sabbath. Now, is there a seal in the law of God? Is it on a stone? Is it the Sabbath? And Christ there in the grave really is a victory. Have you ever thought about that? Jesus on the Sabbath day rested from his work of saving the human race. It was so important he rested. He didn't rise Sunday morning to commemorate a new day of rest. He woke up to go back to work as our high priest. So people who say that it's a new Sabbath because he got up to work, I'd, why would that, you'd have him sleep until Monday morning if that was going to be the way it would work, right? But he rested. He even kept the Sabbath in his death and he woke up and went back to work as our high priest now uh, before the Father. So they put a seal on the stone. You know, I can't read this without going back to Daniel chapter 6. A stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and the signet of his lords that the purpose concerning Daniel might, might not be changed. Was Daniel innocent? Was he? Did Daniel come out alive? Did Jesus come out alive? Who is that lion? The devil goes around as a roaring lion. The devil 
could not keep Jesus and the lions could not keep Daniel. So there are some beautiful analogies there. And how did it happen? Matthew 28, verse 1, an angel descends. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven. This is the angel who replaced Lucifer. And came down and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. He sat on it, indicating that he's not going back. It's over. Now, I like to think about what's going on behind the scenes. If you are the devil and your principal enemy is the seed of the woman, Jesus, and the devil hates Jesus, the ulterior motive for everything the devil does to harass you and me and cause misery in the world is really designed to target Jesus. The great controversy is between Christ and Satan. The devil is driven by hatred that he will never get over of Jesus. Even though he knows his time is short, he's going to expend his last hours ripping and tearing like a rabid dog to do everything he can to hurt Christ and his church. When Jesus was in the tomb and his body was cold and wrapped and sealed, he may have seemed the most vulnerable. If the devil has an office, and if he ever throws an office party, he probably was having his office party. Because the devil, I mean, if he was ever going to entertain any illusions, there was hope of him winning, that would have been the time. I mean, you wonder how the devil can ever think he's going to win because so far every prophecy comes true and he knows what the prophecies say about him. But if he ever, I mean, at the end the devil's going to think he can take the city of God. He's crazy. Right? Sin makes you crazy. To think that the creation could overcome the creator is really crazy. But the devil is, thinks these things. He has these illusions, delusions. And if he ever could convince himself, I'm winning, it must have been when Christ was in the tomb. Are you with me? Does that make sense? And I always like to picture this office party, the devil and the demons. They said, we've got them. The disciples are discouraged. They've lost hope. The church is where we want them. Christ is where we want them. We now have the earth. It's ours. Can you imagine when that angel came down and rolled that stone away and Christ took his life up? He says, I lay my life down, I take it up. And the Bible seems to say that the Father rose him up, and it seems to say Jesus rose himself, and the only thing I can gather is since God and the Father are one, they did it together. But when Christ rose up, there must have been, I mean, if you got a hundred Roman soldiers guarding the tomb, any good devil would have a few demons left watching what was happening there. And some of them must have said, I better go tell Lucifer about this, it's going to ruin the party but he needs to know. And can you imagine what it, the expression must have been like on the devil's face when he's got his party hat on and, and he's blowing one of those things down there and, and one of his demons says, Lucifer, I've got some bad news. I don't know how to tell you this, but the party's over. <laughs> I always like to think about that. What do you mean? He's alive. He came back to life. And uh, that must have been a sight to behold. An earthquake marked the hour when Jesus laid down his life, and another earthquake marked the moment when he took it up. And when Jesus rose, at that moment, all of these saints, now I don't know exactly how many there were, I think there were 24, because you read in the Old Testament about how there were divisions of 24 that praised God in the temple, you read in the New Testament about 24 elders around the throne of God, and I think those elders around the throne of God are composed of the ones who are in this special resurrection. It may also include Enoch and Elijah, I don't know, Moses. But here you've got these patriarchs. Some said, well, maybe some of the antediluvians were there and they were 18 feet tall. I don't think so. They would have stood out pretty well in Jerusalem, right? And Jerusalem was not inhabited back then. These were some of the Jews who around the city of God had laid down their lives, prophets and kings. 
and they begin to show up in the city. You know why? The disciples aren't bearing witness. The soldiers have been paid not to bear witness. And Jesus said, look, if I can't get the living to bear witness, then I've got angels that will do it, and I'll resurrect a handful that will bear witness. And they were milling around the city, these noble, glorified creatures that were appearing here and there to the faithful, saying, he's alive. I'm John the Baptist, and I'm back to tell you. Now, you notice Jesus does not appear for the purpose of convincing his enemies. His main burden is to convince the believers. The angels are giving the messages to the believers who are discouraged. And he specifically tells the women, go tell the disciples and Peter. Why Peter? Why is Peter specifically mentioned? I think Peter was that far from suicide. I mean, Judas was overcome. He repented. He went out and hung himself. Peter went out and wept bitterly, and he thought, you know, I'm not any better than Judas. And he needed some encouragement. And did the Lord hear his prayers when he was sobbing back there in the garden by himself? As Christ arose, he brought from the grave a multitude of captives. I meant to read this earlier. The earthquake at his death rent open their graves, and when he arose, they came forth with him. They were those who had been co-laborers with God, who at the cost of their lives had borne testimony to the truth. Now they were to be witnesses for him who had raised them from the dead. You know, you wonder if one of them went to Peter, or if some of them went to Joseph or some of the others to encourage them. You know, I think it's interesting. Uh, of the major world religions, you have... Uh, Judaism, the leader would be Abraham. He is dead. He was buried in Hebron in the cave of Machpelah. We know where it is. It's guarded today. You've got Buddhism with millions of adherents, India and China, principally China, many in America. Siddhartha Gautama their founder died about 80 years of age. Did you know it was from eating contaminated pork? That's what they say. That's the history record. You should know that. Might have been a nice guy. He was just looking for enlightenment himself. But he was buried, and they got different parts of his body enshrined. I think the most valuable shrine is they supposedly have a tooth, and it's enshrined. And people go and worship. Then you got Islam. Muhammad, principal prophet. No argument that he is dead and buried, and where do they all go to worship him? They pray towards Mecca, where he's buried and he's dead. But when it comes to Jesus, what makes the Christian religion different is that he's alive. I've got a picture, actually, of the garden tomb. Why don't you jump to that, Cheryl? And uh, I went to Israel. You know, they've got the... Um, tomb of the Holy Sepulchre, which is sort of the Roman Catholic shrine they developed. But it's inside the city. It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't seem to fit any of the biblical criteria. And years ago, uh, an Englishman who was living in uh, Israel when it was occupied by the English began to do some research. And based on the clues given in the Bible, he looked at this hill, believed to be the skull Golgotha, and not far from there was a garden, and there was, it wasn't far from the city wall. And he added this all up, and he said, about here should be the place. And they did some excavations. They actually found a tomb that was empty. There was a garden. They found a cistern. Not far away, they found a stone. And it really is kind of exciting when you go there. Have any of you been to Israel and you, you've seen this? They call it Gordon's tomb. And most people now think this is a more realistic site that could have been the tomb. What's interesting is when you go, there's a little wooden door on the tomb. Uh, and they just put that there for, to close it off at the end of the day. And when you go in, this is what it says on the door. He's not here. <laughs> He's risen. And that really is good news when you think about it. We are worshiping a God who, he said, I am with you always. I'm not dead. I'm alive. You know, some people struggle with this. I don't know how it works. But I don't have a problem believing it. Because the same, you know, for me, I can't understand how evolutionists and atheists say, how can you possibly believe in the resurrection? And yet they can't explain where life came from. I mean, it is just as much a miracle to have a single cell of life as for God to resurrect. 
Uh, Andrew Jones every now and then emails me something. I guess last week he emailed me. They've been doing some excavation at the tomb of Herod and they found a date seed 2,000 years old and they planted it and it sprouted and it's growing a variety of date that is pretty much extinct now. Do you know the dates that they grow in Israel are California dates? <laughs> a little amazing fact for you. So you don't have to go to Israel. You go to Indio if, <laughs> if you want to get dates. But 2,000 years old and it sprouted. Or I've heard of a piece of red wheat that they found in an Egyptian tomb they planted. 3,500 years old and it sprouted. How does that essence of life stay in there? I don't know. So when the Bible says that Jesus came back to life, I don't have a problem with that. And that gives you and I courage that this life is not it. This is really just the launching pad for eternity. You know what I think the greatest evidence is that Jesus is alive? is when people see him alive in you and me. And uh, that's the best testimony. I remember reading about uh, Michael Faraday, who was a chemist, a great scientist, and a Christian, a workman in his laboratory one day bumped a silver cup that Faraday had. It fell from the shelf into a vat of acid and it was quickly dissolved. And the workman felt absolutely awful because it was some family cup that had been passed down in the Faraday family and he felt terrible about it. Well, the great chemist came in, he felt, found out what happened, he felt so sorry for his workman who was so forlorn, uh, forlorn and ashamed that uh, he had destroyed his silver cup. Faraday looked at the acid, he poured another chemical in the acid, it separated the silver, it made a lump at the bottom, he pulled it out, he gave it to a silversmith who fashioned it into the very same cup that he had before. Now, if a human could do that with a silver cup to reassemble it like that. Why do we think God can't do it? I mean, I can't explain it because I'm not a chemist and I'm not God. But when the Bible says, Jesus said, I will rise again, how does a baby? To me, it's just as much a miracle. It's like Solomon, the wisest man said, who knows how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child. It's a miracle. I can't explain it. But I believe it. Every time I look at you, you're proof that life happens. And if it happened once, it can happen again, right? In our next study, we'll talk more about the various appearances and final instruction. But I think it's good enough to stop on this point right now and just remember that He lives. Amen? Amen. And He's alive. We're going to sing this happy song, 251. Why don't we stand together, take your hymnals, turn to 251, and let's sing with enthusiasm. Let the Lord know we believe that He is alive and want it to show on our faces as we go from this place. The best message of the resurrection is in the same way that Jesus came back to life, He can give you new life, you can have a new heart and be a new creature. That's what it means. He lives within my heart. How many of you would like to say this morning, Lord, I want to experience that resurrection in my life. I want you to be remade in me. Is that your prayer? All right, then I want you to sing that like you believe it, especially on the chorus. And let's go ahead with verse 3 now because I've kept you a little long. Sing it with encouragement.
Loving Lord, eternal God, we are so thankful for the news that we are worshiping a living God, that Jesus is alive today and he wants to live in our hearts. Lord, I pray that each of us here will consciously say we want to experience that recreation, that resurrection, create within us a new heart. We pray that Jesus will dwell within us, that our lives that are often cold tombs might experience new life. And what you did in that tomb 2,000 years ago, you can do in our minds and hearts today. Come into our lives, Lord, and let others who see us know that this religion serves a living God. Bless us as we go from this place to also model and show by our example we believe you are with us wherever we go. Thank you for the good news, Lord, that Christ is alive and for being with us. Thank you again and bless us with your spirit today. We pray for Christ's sake.